I'll give a brief introduction. Hi, I'm Joel Berg, uh, CEO of Hunger Free America. We're a national nonprofit direct service and advocacy organization. If anyone watching needs help getting food, please call 1-866-3-HUNGRY to reach the National Hunger Hotline, which we run on behalf of USDA. You can also find food or ways that you can help at hungerfreeamerica.org. Big thanks to the Biden-Harris Presidential Inaugural Committee for co-sponsoring this event, to everyone watching, to everyone volunteering on our phone banks, and to all our very distinguished guests. Special thanks to the AmeriCorps National Service participants who are serving our country this day and every day. They are getting things done while promoting community, opportunity, and responsibility. To paraphrase Dickens, these are the worst of times and the best of times. These are the worst of times because democracy has been under violent attack at the same time that more than 2 million people worldwide and more than 400,000 of our fellow Americans have perished from COVID-19. As President-elect Biden said last week, one in seven households in America and more than one in five Black and Latino households now report they don't have enough to eat. We know that people who are malnourished have compromised immune systems and are less more likely to contract and transmit COVID-19. We also know that because Americans who are food insecure can afford the healthiest foods, they are more likely to suffer from obesity, hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes, and are less more likely to die from COVID-19. In 1858, Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. Today, we know that a nation with tens of millions of hungry Americans cannot stand. We also know that a nation where life and death are decided by the color of your skin or your income cannot stand. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. knew that economic justice and racial justice were inseparably tied. Shortly before he was assassinated, Dr. King said, what does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't even have enough money to buy a hamburger? He launched the Poor People's Campaign, which played a key role in convincing policymakers to create the modern USDA food safety net, which has saved countless Americans from starvation in the decades since but which today, unfortunately, is tattered and inadequate. Yet these can also become the best of times. Vaccines are on the way. And despite the hard recent violence, we have once again ensured that democracy has prevailed and that ultimately the ballot is again more powerful than the bullet. A new administration will take office in just two days. They give us great hope because President-elect Biden, Vice President-elect Harris, and Secretary Vilsack fully understand the severity and scope of the country's hunger crisis. They also know that to defeat the pandemic, build the, back the economy better, and repair the torn civic fiber, fabric of the nation, we need to take bold, comprehensive steps to slash U.S. hunger and the poverty that causes it. They understand that ending hunger lifts us all. Tom Vilsack served with great distinction in the as the United States Secretary of Agriculture for all eight years of the Obama-Biden administration. He and his top-notch team at USDA used every administrative tool available to fight hunger, improve school meals, and make nutritious food available to all Americans. I know he's dedicated to doing even more in the Biden-Harris administration to make hunger history. It's an honor to introduce Secretary Tom Vilsack. Mr. Secretary. Joel, thank you very much. And certainly it is a distinct honor uh, to be asked to be part of this amazing network of folks who are volunteering their time on Martin Luther King Day and to be part of a panel that includes uh, distinguished folks like Senator Schumer, uh, Chef Andres and, and uh, Rachel Ray. I wanna thank you, Joel, and your team at uh, Hunger Free America for being the conscience of America on this issue. You are the essential workers uh, in this effort to raise the awareness of all of America about the uh, tr tremendous challenge that we face with reference to hunger and nutrition insecurity. You know, I would say that if Martin Luther King were alive today, he would be deeply, deeply tr troubled by the fact that we have 30% of American families who are currently nutrition and food insecure. He would be troubled by the fact that 40% of our black families, 42.6 million total Americans need SNAP uh, what would he think? What would he say? Uh, he would obviously be impressed with the work that's being done at Hunger Free America. He would certainly be impressed with the amazing work that's been done by food banks and pantries 
uh, throughout the United States to meet this incredible need. But I think he would basically suggest that government has a significant role to play and a role that needs to be elevated and a role that needs to be enhanced. I think he would say that it starts with making sure that government protects those who work, the dignity of work by ensuring that there is a living wage connected to that work. That would go a long way uh, to making a hunger-free America. I think he would suggest that the nutrition assistance programs that are administered at USDA need to be ones that are easy to qualify for and sign up for in this day and age of, of, of cell phones. So the opportunity for a hassle-free system, especially for those who live on small or, or no income, uh, families of color, uh, terribly concerned about the fact that so many don't get the help they need because of the tremendous administrative burden that's just associated today with signing up for programs that they're entitled to receive. I think Martin Luther King would suggest that the benefits that are currently in the SNAP program, even with the 15% increase recently uh, enacted by Congress, are simply not sufficient and that we need to look for creative ways to stretch those resources uh, to use the full extent uh, of the law to get as much relief to as many people as possible. Uh, I think he would also say that it's time that we made the use of those benefits as convenient as possible. The world's changed. Uh, it's not just a grocery store. It, it's a restaurant that could potentially be available to provide a decent meal. It's a school. Uh, there needs to be ways in which online opportunities are expanded. I'm pretty sure that he would say that the benefits need to be equitably administered. It's not just uh, uh, families who live in cities and rural areas. It's also families that live in, in settlements and reservations with a tribal food program and those who live in our territories. The reality is hunger hurts regardless of where you live and who you are. I think he would also suggest that we need school programs that continue to understand the importance that schools play in providing adequate uh, and, and nutrition uh, and, and uh, the ability of those schools to continue to provide resources flexibly during this time of COVID. Uh, whether a child is sitting in a desk in school or whether the child is home, the reality is many, many children in America today still rely on that school breakfast and that school lunch. And we need to make sure that we continue to provide support to schools so they in turn can provide that opportunity. We need to make sure that the pandemic EBT uh, is administered simply uh, and effectively with clear guidance. Uh, so as many families as possible uh, receive assistance and help with a particular focus on our children under the age of six years old, because we know how important proper nutrition is for their growth and development. And I think he would also urge us to take a look at our WIC program and raise questions as to why only 50% of those who are qualified for the program use the program. Joel, I could talk for a long time about the important role that USDA can play in this effort. Joining with Hunger Free America and other institutions and organizations, we can eradicate hunger and we should. It's a national embarrassment. The time has come for us to take bold and significant action. And I know that the Biden-Harris administration is prepared to do that. And if confirmed, I certainly expect to do that in its leadership at the United States Department of Agriculture. So I wish everyone well. I wanna thank all of those who are volunteering today for the tremendous effort that you're gonna to undertake today. It's gonna to make a difference. Let's keep up the fight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Chuck Schumer has been an ally of hungry people for decades of public service, from his time in the US Congress to being a rank and file US Senator, to being the Democratic Majority Leader, and now in just a few days, and some of us are counting the seconds, until the Majority Leader of the United States Senate. He's been there for us and hungry Americans and hungry New Yorkers, uh, no matter what we needed, often out of the spotlight. Uh, he's just been a tremendous leader and a tremendous ally, and we're just so honored to have him with us today. Senator Schumer. Well, thank you, Joel. I want to thank you and Hunger Free America and all of those who are listening today and so many more who work so hard to eradicate hunger, to feed the hungry. And, you know, it's so appropriate we are talking on Dr. King Day. Dr. King fought inequality in America. When someone is hungry, you cannot have equality. You can't, if you're hungry, it leads to all other forms of inequality, whether it's healthcare inequality or housing inequality or job inequality. Hunger, feeding people, giving them adequate food, nutrition, is it the key to bringing equality to America? No one does more for that than Joel Berg. No one does more for that than Hungry Free America. On Dr. King Day and on all the other 364 days in the calendar, we salute you. Job well done, continue the fight. I wanna to thank Tom Vilsack. He said, if he gets confirmed, 
I'll do everything I can to confirm this man in good part because he understands the needs of hungry people and what America has to do as his speech showed. And I wanna thank Chef Jose Andres, uh, Rachel Ray, June Diane Raphael, and Natasha McRae from the Bronx. I'm from Brooklyn, Natasha. Uh, uh, all to be speakers here. And everyone who's on this video for the great work that you do. So many of you provide those essential on the ground services in communities. We can pass legislation, but if we don't get the food to people, legislation does no good. It's a means to the end. You provide that end, ensuring that people have access to food and other essentials, particularly during this crisis. So I wanna say three words to all of the work, all the people providing the services on this phone. You inspire me. You inspire all of us, thank you. Let me talk for a minute about Dr. King because it's so important we remember his legacy and put it into action. He is one of the greatest Americans who's ever walked the face of the earth. And think about this. It's not a coincidence that MLK Day is the only day, the only day on our calendar dedicated to one single American. We have Mother's Day for all the mothers and Father's Day for all the fathers and Veterans Day for the veterans, July 4th for the nation's founders and patriots, but only one day for one man. And that's because Dr. King was so singular, so exceptional, so unique. I like to think about it this way. He took a giant mirror, giant heavy mirror, and hoisted it on his broad shoulders. And with his eloquence, his faith, his brilliance, he forced America to look into that mirror. And America didn't like what it saw. And that began the slow, long, continuing trek to bring equality, full equality, and respect to every, every American. He unflinchingly exposed our worst impulses and in that way inspired the better nature of our better angels of our nature. Because of that, he made America a better place. He made each and every one of us a better person. I was proud as a young congressman when I, was, when I helped spearhead the drive to make MLK a federal holiday in the face of ignorance and bigotry. And what we saw in the Capitol just a few weeks ago shows us how much ignorance, bigotry, cynicism, viciousness, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, all uh, still exist in America. But in honor of Dr. King's legacy, it's all of our responsibility to never, never avert our gaze from injustices that continue. And that we must do. Now we had a good COVID-19 bill uh, in, in December. You all know the details, 13 billion in nutrition assistance, 15% increase in SNAP, new SNAP flexibilities, waiving those college student work requirements, 614 billion for Puerto Rico, 400 million for emergency food assistance, 175 million for senior nutrition, 4.6 billion to expand the PEBT to improve the, uh, which we still need during the pandemic. But as Vilsack showed, we have so much more to do. And Joel, I wanna make you and Hunger Free America a pledge. We will be shoulder to shoulder, not to rest on our laurels, but to continue working until we achieve the day when no one goes hungry in America, when no one goes hungry in America. And there is reason to be hopeful about the future. We're gonna have Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as president and vice president. We have, it so happens, a new majority leader, as Congress will seat John Ossoff, the young protege of Congressman John Lewis and Reverend Raphael Warnock, Lewis's former pastor. And when Warnock was born, Georgia was represented in the Senate by two staunch, bigoted segregationists. And of course, as I mentioned, the Senate will turn Democratic control under the first New York-born majority leader in history. I'm the son of an exterminator and a homemaker descended directly from victims of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So as Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe bends in the direction of justice. I'm humbled, I promise mm -hmm. to fight for each and every one of you every day that I serve as majority leader. And we will redouble our efforts to end hunger. We will redouble our efforts to end inequality altogether. And let's just think of the future. One day, if we keep fighting, 
than the solemnity of, the, of this holiday. Maybe we'll be a thing of the past. One day, if we wipe out inequality, whether it comes, whether it's in nutrition or in every other aspect of American society, we'll be able to celebrate this holiday with parades and laughter for the victory we achieved over inequality. One day, one day. So thank you for letting me join you in honoring one of the greatest Americans to ever grace our country. And thank you for continuing that fight against inequality on the nutrition front. May Dr. King continue to be a stirring example for all of us in the days ahead. Thank you so much, Senator. You know, I, I lost family in the Holocaust as well. And when I, what I learned when I visited a concentration camp in Germany, among the first people rounded up were homeless people. And it just reinforces our message and Dr. King's message that a threat to the humanity of anyone is a threat to humanity of everyone. So thank you, uh, you know, Senator. Thank you. Uh, chef Andres has, is an incredible chef, if you've ever eaten at Aleo at any of uh, his other uh, restaurants, but uh, really came to world prominence as humanitarian with uh, his kitchen program, Global Central Kitchen, which uh, fed many people in Puerto Rico after the hurricane and now around uh, the world. Uh, he's just been selflessly doing this all throughout uh, America, most recently serving National Guard uh, troops in the nation's capital. So it's just such an honor to have Chef Andres here. World Central Kitchen, I should get the name right. Thank you, Chef Andres. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for, very much for having me and um, for your uh, leadership, uh, you all, on all of this. And it was great to listen to the words of Secretary uh, Bilsack and Senator uh, Schumer. Um, obviously, in this moment, I don't believe we can have a better leader at the USDA. Uh, an amazing, a great governor who became a great secretary. Uh, and in this moment, somebody with his experience, uh, I believe he's the right person to do great things in the next four or eight years. Uh, I'm speaking right across from uh, my first restaurant in Washington, D.C. And here you see one of the food trucks of Old Central Kitchen that has been activated uh, all across uh, America. And right here, back in 1996, uh, I saw Secretary Dan Glickman. Uh, with uh, my favorite food fighter, Robert Egger, uh, trying to show the example of policy could have an effect on feeding Americans. The Good Samaritan bill passed in 1996, and Secretary Glickman and Robert Egger and myself, we fill up uh, the back of a truck of DC Central Kitchen. There we saw policy connected to real boots on the ground how can effectively we can really dream of a hunger-free America and why not one day hungry, free, free world. So uh, today we are honoring the legacy of a great man, Martin, Martin Luther King. And I think one of my favorite quotes was, if you cannot do great things, do small things great. And this is the moment we are living. We all are seeing the effects that this pandemic is having in so many Americans all across. This is not anymore about the political spectrum. This, is, this hunger is affecting blue states and red states. It's affecting Americans in urban environments and in rural America. We are all seeing long lines in food banks. We are all seeing NGOs that they are used working beyond capacity to try to keep hospitals, elderly homes, homeless, families falling behind. And today we heard Secretary Bilsack all the opportunities we have to really tackle hunger in America. I think we all need to keep talking, but I think is the time to talk, but to start doing. We need to be bold and I know President uh, Biden, Vice President Harris will be bold because the urgency of now in the words of Martin Luther King, when we talk about hunger should be yesterday. So all of us, we know that we, we, we have the ways to make it happen, but we need to make sure that we reach once and for all, everyone. People don't want our pity. People want our respect. 
let's make sure that we pay every single American what is right. So on their own, with their hard work, they can raise above hunger. Let's make sure that the federal programs are in place to maximize the potential of those programs to feed Americans. Secretary Bilsack has said it. Let's make sure that SNAPs and we can be used in restaurants. Let's make sure that we start ending food deserts if the federal government wants in partnership with private sector and NGOs is no reason why we should have any more in America food deserts. And we can keep going on and on. As I repeat, if we cannot do great things, let's do small things great. Let's make sure that we bring all those programs that the USDA has been moving forward to the maximum possibility of effect to eradicate hunger once and for all. And let me tell you, the last big food conference ever in America happened during the Nixon times in 1969, actually the year I born, over 50 years ago. I don't think it's too bold to be dreaming that we could have a 2022 White House Food Summit, where we bring every single partner and player to make sure bold and new ideas, new recipes will be coming to the table to make sure that we believe in this dream of shorter walls and longer tables. And to end, I do believe that as much as the leadership of Secretary Bilsack, who I know is gonna be working closely with President Biden in the White House, I do believe USDA alone cannot use eradicate hunger. I do believe it's about time we bring many other departments working together. I think it's the time to have a national director of food and nutrition at the White House. Food is a national security issue, but food that seems right now is the problems of many issues we face. We need to see once and for all that actually food can be the solution of all those problems. So people of America, thank you for having me uh, with all of you today. Let's do it. We, if we work together, we, the people, we can end hunger. Let's go for it. Let's make it happen. God bless you all. And congratulations to Biden Harris and, and the best of luck for the next four years. Thank you, Chef Andres. Uh, and thank you for that shout out to my old boss, Dan Glickman. I was actually with him and you and Robert Ager that day. And I understand he's watching uh, today. So I thank him for his great leadership over many decades for a young man. Now, if, if so thank you, Chef, for everything you do. Now, if you watch uh, any of Rachel Ray's shows, you know she's the hardest working woman in, in food. Uh, you know, since the pandemic, she's doing what normally a, a crew of many, many people are doing herself and basically her husband. She fit this in today between two tapings. Goodness knows how early you woke up to do this. She's a philanthropist. I don't want to embarrass her, but she donates generously to us and many other hunger groups around the country. She's an author uh, and uh, she's also an activist. She was very very influential in working with us to pass stronger child nutrition standards as part of the last child nutrition reauthorization bill. And in between all that, she manages to have a show or two or three. So we're, we're just so honored for her to be here today. Uh, welcome, Rachel. Joel, I'm honored to be here with you. And you've been a constant inspiration um, to me. You know that. Uh, I don't want to embarrass you. Um, but you really... Uh, you, you fuel the fire in a good way. You've always filled me with hope when I felt most discouraged and you continue to do that. Uh, and uh, I really wanna build on what uh, Chef Andres, what my friend Jose was saying. This really takes everyone, all of us. I think we are in a time of hope. Although the last week of our lives, there were many moments that felt uh, just heartbreaking and disheartening. Um, I also look at the last year of my life and the purpose of our show switched when I moved up here. Our, our, I haven't been in New York City or to a studio, a television studio in a year's time now. But seeing you, Joel, and Senator Schumer today soon to be our majority leader, Secretary Vilsack, our nominee, who I, I know will, will be the wind at our, our back again, and under the Biden-Harris administration, I know we'll have that force behind us so that everyone, private sector, 
NGOs, all of us can come together on every level. And I've spent the last year of my life trying to prove that to myself and to our viewership with our little show that we do here from home. It's, it's fun to have on celebrities and athletes and people that we admire, but what's most important to us and what has been for especially uh, March to the end of 2020 and present day is sharing with America, Americans that have taken it in their own hands to do what their local state or federal government was falling short on to pivot not only with their businesses, but in changing their careers and their lives to literally feed their neighbor and care for their neighbor. Yes, I'm working today, grace of God, knock on wood. But Martin Luther King, Dr. King was working the night before he left this planet. And I think it was that night that he said he could see the other side of the mountain. And I, I, I feel that way now. I feel that I can see the other side of the mountain because I've seen so many stories of people in the darkest year for this entire planet, not just this country. In the darkest year, I see story after story and I read letter after letter of people that chose that moment in their lives not to be filled with fear, not to be torn apart with bitterness and anger, but to care for their neighbors, their communities, and to feed each other and to offer their, their, their open arms, though we can't hug and we can't see each other's faces. I see hope in people's eyes every single day and I listen to their stories. And our time is coming, our time is now. This is the most important year probably of my life. Last year was a year where I literally watched my home burn to the ground. I lost my dog of 15 years. We hit some times of despair. The world's in a pandemic. I watched my capital literally get overrun a week ago and a Confederate flag walk through its hollow, beautiful, extraordinary halls. And yeah, we all hit those points, those big, just huge potholes in the road. But I've never felt more enthusiastic in my life about what was to come. And I think 2031 will be an entirely different world. And it might be a world where we've ended hunger in this country. Maybe we're well on our way to ending it in this world. Uh, I started my brand along with our show uh, more than 15 years ago now. And from day one, I have used it as a vehicle to fuel our philanthropic efforts. As you know, Joel, we, we, we try and spread that money in in ways that it can be measured. One of our biggest partners is World Central Kitchen, uh, but we work with so many and, and we try and make sure we're spending enough money on seniors and relief in different areas and uh, helping to build infrastructure. But I think the number one infrastructure we have is human infrastructure. Feeding American kids has always been at the heart of this for me. I don't have kids of my own. I wanna help our public schools and our federal and local governments and state governments provide food security for our kids in this country 12 months a year. I, I want them to have time to look at each other and socialize with each other, to build their social skills. I want them to be better, stronger humans so that we can all stop fighting about things like healthcare costs and where the country is going because we'll have smarter, more involved people. And it all begins with just the simplest of things. Do we have food security? And I think it takes everyone coming together. Every single person can change the fabric. We're all one stitch, but we're all part of one giant quilt. And it takes all of us to come together to do that. And I feel very inspired to be here among this distinguished group of people. And I feel that very passionately that this is the year we start that. And I don't think it's, a, it's going to be a, a complete uphill climb. I think we've got some steps layered in there already. And I think we're going to start taking those steps by twos and threes. And we're going to get smarter and stronger. We're going to be our own little superheroes. And I think we're going to get there together. For my part, I try and use my voice, uh, period, to share the stories, tell the stories. And I will do anything. You know, I, I'm good in a kitchen. I'm good on a front line. I'll go anywhere. Uh, have sneakers, we'll travel, we'll, you know, <laughs> we'll work to give you food. 
won't work for food, but I'll work to give you food. <laughs> um, so I am here and ready to go. And I, I hope um, that Joel, you you will call upon me and secretary and, and the entire um, Biden-Harris administration. I think we've got some really brilliant, beautiful, really special people um, that are humble and smart and focused. Um, so that's really all I have to say. I'm, I, I'm just here and I, I hope that I stay active and, and I hope that I can become more and more involved in, in what our country needs. Thank you so much, Rachel. Before I introduce Natasha McCray, I just wanna thank our great staff, Stephanie and Erica and Nicole, who puts this together and all the rest of our staff. I get a lot of the screen time, but they do a lot of the hard work and, and all our, our volunteers and supporters and our financial supporters. You know, we at Hunger Free America understand from the lesson of Dr. King that no social movement in the history of the world has been won by one people on behalf of another. I have nothing against upper middle class white people being one. But the idea that just upper middle class white people are going to solve this problem is really preposterous. And that's why we work really hard through our Food Action Board project to make sure that people with lived experience, their voice is heard, their message is heard, their stories are told, and they are not just participants, but leaders in that movement. So I'm so honored to have my colleague Natasha McRae from our Food Action Board program in the Bronx join us today. Thank you, Natasha. Good morning, Natasha. Good job. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Natasha McCray, and as he said, I live in the Bronx. I have two children, a five-year-old and a 17-year-old. I'm an educator, volunteer, and have been a member of Hunger Free's Food Action Board for over 10 years, where we help to advocate for the needs of low-income families in New York City, and I'm one of those families. I just want to briefly share my experience. 2020 was definitely the most unforgettable year in history. I found myself like others navigating new waters of remote learning. How am I gonna feed my children? How are we gonna do all of these things with their schools closed for 70 days plus? I'm thankful for the food banks. I'm thankful for the local pantries and SNAP benefits that got us through those very hard times. In my Bronx neighborhood, early March and April, I experienced the long lines of grocery stores, the increased prices of necessities, eggs, milk, and such. I found myself having to leave my neighborhood to find better qualities of food and better prices. We're also very grateful for the pandemic EBD program that granted additional funding to displaced students during the pandemic. This has been a challenging time for all families, including myself. Yeah, I know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Martin Luther King Jr. had dreams of equality for all people that goes beyond race, creed, gender, or economic status. My request is that many of the government programs that were funded continue to be funding. An increase in SNAP benefits benefits the entire community. For every $1, it generates $1.50 in the economy. Also allowing for an increase in online EBT participation with local grocers will make a difference for many who are suffering during this time of pandemic. An increase to programs such as WIC, the Women's Infant and Children Program, which provides supplemental foods to women and children under the age of five. A living wage of $15 or more will help individuals to take better care of their families. Higher wages equal better quality of living. And rental assistance for those who are affected by the pandemic. We are living in dire times, yet I feel that we will be able to come together as a community and a nation to give a step up to those who need it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. We're honored by your, your leadership and your partner with us. Closing out the program is June Diane Raphael. She's an actress, she's a writer, she's an activist. Uh, she started TV comedy programs such as Burning Love and Grace and Frankie. I, I have to mention that she's also had roles in my two, two of my favorite series of all time, Curb Your Enthusiasm and Veep, which just shows that she's really into feel good. Uh, shows. <laughs> so uh, uh, with that, uh, thank you for joining us, June Jayan Raphael. Oh my gosh, Joel, thank you so much for having me. I hope everyone can hear me okay. I, um, you know, I have had a career in Hollywood and I've always thought that I've maybe slept my way to the bottom, uh, right onto basic cable, but being amongst this amazing panel of unbelievable <laughs> leaders and people, I'm thinking, you know what? I may have made some smart decisions along the way. It is such an honor to be here. 
And I uh, want to say, yes, my name is June Diane Raphael. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I wanted to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I'm on in Oregon right now, the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde and their elders past and present. And I know so many of us are signing in from all over the country. And I wanna just take a second and acknowledge the indigenous peoples of this country and their elders past and present. So many have mentioned uh, before me today that we are observing Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, and I, I'm so inspired that it is a day of service, the only federal holiday observed as a day on and not a day off, a day meant to empower us to find solutions to the injustices in the world and move us closer to Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. And the question this day asks me, how do I carry his sacrifices, those of so many unnamed voices to create a world with greater justice, equity and peace? And Dr. King understood the main cause of hunger in America is poverty. Even before the pandemic, the US had the highest poverty rate out of any Western industrialized democracy. In 2019, when the overall economy was theoretically strong, 34 million Americans, equaling the combined populations of Ohio, Arizona, Maine, Iowa, and Georgia, lived below the meager federal poverty line $21,330 for a family of three. Now let's remember that number because if an American were to work 35 hours per week for 52 weeks, taking no vacation at the federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour, they would earn $13,195, leaving them significantly below the poverty line. Many people who work for tips in farm labor farm labor and off the books earn even less than that. In 2019, 58.8 million U.S. residents live below 200% of the poverty line. 200% of the poverty line. Now that's the kind of math that hurts my little actress brain. I'm, I'm not that smart. I'm just not. But in plain English, it means that even pre-pandemic, Nearly one in five Americans live near or below the poverty line. That takes my breath away. The decline of the middle class is one of the top reasons for our soaring poverty and hunger today. And the very best way to reduce US hunger and poverty is to ensure that work, ensure that we can guarantee workers a living wage in this country. And we have a chance to do that right now with this new administration. And it's actually more than a chance. I believe for me, it's our moral imperative. It's a moral directive for each and every one of us on this call. Our own sense of our own humanity requires it. Now we have learned and I've learned that the coronavirus and this pandemic is actually not the great equalizer, but the great revealer of a broken world. It's revealed that along with state violence, Black lives are also disproportionately taken from this virus. Indigenous lives are taken at rates unlike other communities. And one of the main lessons I'm taking is that if one of us in our beloved community is not well, then we are all not well. Mm -hmm. If a four-year-old is hungry in a house 100 miles from mine, when my four-year-old and my six-year-old children have gone to bed well fed, that child is not well and I am not well either. And I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, I'm so excited for this call to action and I'm so hopeful that we can get well together and work toward being a part of a beloved community. Thank you so much for having me.